Welcome to the News Project Live. This is episode five, Protests and the Press. Short-term challenges, long-term changes. Our guests this week are Meredith Clark, Department of Media Studies at the University of Virginia, and Jeff Jarvis, Director of the Toe Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at CUNY the Newmark School of Journalism. This is a weekly conversation with media industry experts and innovators about the future of news brought to you by the News Project. Our hosts are Merrill Brown, CEO of the News Project, and Alex Leo, head of audience for the News Project. Welcome. I'm Merrill Brown in New York City, and we're pleased to have you at tonight's edition of the News Project Live. Thursday evenings, we cover some of the most critical challenges facing the news industry, and nothing is more pressing than consideration of the events of the past 10 days, both here in the United States and around the world. Our topic tonight is the protests, how they're being handled by the press, what needs to be done in news organizations to address protester concerns about issues like civil rights, race, justice, and national leadership. It's a moment for, of reflection for all of us and for the news business, of course, as well. It's important to assess coverage. Has it been fair? Has it highlighted the most pressing issues? Have official sources carried disproportionate weight? Has the right balance been put in place looking at protest and at looting? But just as important is the media response. What can change about hiring practices, beats, supports for uh, educational programs, new tools and capabilities, and what new entrepreneurial news organizations can be developed to address the inadequacies of reporting on our communities and on vital national and local topics. At the News Project, we're working to build technology and services to help small to medium-sized newsrooms address their product and business challenges and to reach audiences, whether on computer or phone. Among our goals is to support startups by providing them the capabilities they need to be successful. A bit more on our work later when I debrief with co-host Alex Leo. And please send us your questions for tonight's program. Good evening uh, in Washington, Alex. How are things there? Everything's good. Um, there was a wonderful protest today up to the cathedral right across the street. Uh, welcome to everyone watching. Thank you for joining us. As Meryl said, please send us your questions um, and tag your friends in the comments so they know to tune in as well. Meryl? Thanks, Alex. Um, on to our show tonight. Joining us to talk about the protests are two very important voices. Meredith Clark is a faculty member at the University of Virginia's Department of Media Studies, where her work focuses on race, media, and power. She is a national leader in studying newsroom diversity and one of the country's foremost authorities on black Twitter. She conducts the annual survey of newsroom diversity prepared with the American Society of News Editors. Jeff Jarvis has a long and distinguished career in news and academia. He is a professor at the City University of New York, Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism, and at CUNY, he's director of the Tao Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism. He has written for a score of major publications and was the founding managing editor of Entertainment Weekly magazine. He is widely quoted and a leader in developing new approaches to news gathering, to news business models, and does his punditry at buzzmachine.com. And with all that, he tweets relentlessly and fearlessly and has done so nearly 138,000 times. Meredith joins us from Charlottesville, Virginia, and Jeff in his home in the New Jersey exurbs. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Meryl. Thank you, Meryl. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Meredith, Jeff, uh, just a couple seconds on how you're coping with um, education and writing and so on and so forth in the midst of the lockdown. Meredith? Well, it's awfully quiet here in Charlottesville. All the students are gone, of course. Um, so it's just us folks who still live in town. It's an interesting time to be on a college campus and see how we're thinking about uh, how we're going to return in the fall, what the future of online education is going to be. Not the most productive time, but uh, certainly an interesting one. Jeff? Uh, I need a haircut. Uh, <laughs> other than that, uh, I'm privileged to be out in the burbs and missing the news that's occurring in uh, New York City. Oh, uh, good to hear you both look well, and I'm glad your work is uh, moving along apace. Uh, let's get started by getting your points of view on what is surely a media moment. 
An unprecedented number of us are home because of the lockdown, because of unemployment and furloughs, and we're consuming a huge amount of news, video, and content about the protests and about protester issues since George Floyd was killed 10 days ago. Among other things, it has been a round-the-clock moment for the major three U.S. cable TV networks and is also a dominant story on television, not just in the United States, but around the world as well. How do you assess how the press is doing? Meredith? Not well enough. Um, unfortunately, the norms and standards, values and practices uh, that have led us to this moment haven't been revisited. And so what we're seeing is the same conditions that paint certain folks as deviant, um, as different, that are, are continually relied upon. And we really need the news media to rethink its strategy, uh, to put people of color at the center of its strategy, and to think about the power dynamics that it holds in the way that it covers these protests. Jeff, your uh, point of view on the coverage you're watching and reading? Um, we're seeing so much come home to roost right now. And, and I think that it's um, disingenuous to act as if we are just discovering the systemic racism in the country and the one-two punch of COVID disproportionately affecting communities of color in all so many ways. And then on top of that, the murder of George Floyd. Uh, there's no avoiding it now, uh, but these are stories we should have been covering and covering far better for far mm -hmm. longer. And it brings up a core problem of our industry, one that Meredith has tried to at least measure through our industry, which is the lack of diversity in newsrooms, the lack of perspective. And we've seen missteps at places like uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I would argue the New York Times lately because of that. Well, Jeff, you can't just sort of leave that out there. You probably ought to share those two anecdotes or those two stories in brief with the audience. Well, real quickly, the Philadelphia Inquirer had a, a print headline a couple days ago. Um, well, uh, now I'm going to forget it. Um, Buildings matter too. Thank you. Buildings matter too. Uh, tone deaf is the lightest possible description, and various members of the Inquirer sent a, a very eloquent letter of protest and did a virtual walkout uh, today. And then the New York Times has had various missteps, but the latest, I would argue, is Tom Cotton getting a um, fascistic uh, op-ed in. And uh, as is usual with the Times, when criticism occurs, and importantly, when African-American staff members of the New York Times protested on Twitter violating the New York Times social media laws, and thus risking themselves, the Times didn't listen. James Bennett, the, right. op, uh, the editorial page editor, uh, just did what the Timesmen, and I say Timesmen purposely, always do, which is to be defensive. Yeah. Alex? Right, and, 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 and often they, they use that phrase, we're listening to you, we hear you, and then go on to defend exactly what they just did, right, Jeff? Exactly. Yeah, so Meredith, I, I wanna get back to those points Jeff brought up, but, but first I wanted to get to what you were just saying about who we paint as deviant, right? In a piece for The Atlantic, Sarah Jackson points to several ways the media is failing uh, during this time, including reinforcing stereotypes of black incivility and pushing an outsider agitator narrative. Can you tell us a bit more of the history of the outsider agitator narrative and why it's so insidious? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so the outsider agitator narrative is something that um, everyone's favorite civil rights leader, the, the quotes that they love from him, mentioned in the letter from a Birmingham jail. Uh, towards the end of the letter, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. mentions that this rhetoric, which uh, really belies its intention, um, is going to push black people to more radical positions, that it's going to push them away from nonviolent action. And what that narrative gives us is one, it's, it's revealing that it's about control, right? Uh, mm -hmm. If these agitators are from outside, what you are essentially saying is the people, the black people, the Hispanic folks in this community, the people of color in this community, they're docile and we have them under our control. It's these mm. outside folks who are coming in and stirring things up. And that does away with a lot of responsibility for the folks in a particular community uh, for suppression, for oppression, and for their lack of humanity, uh, the extension of a lack of humanity to people who are not like them. Right. 
Uh, that piece also points to an over-reliance on government and police sources that paint protesters as chaos agents. Um, how can journalists combat that while still asking hard questions of government and law enforcement? I think the first thing to do is to check the language that is being used to describe these protests. Uh, one thing that has really gotten under my skin lately is this over-reliance on the phrase, uh, the dichotomy of the peaceful protest versus the violent protest. Protest mm -hmm. is central to American citizenship, uh, to the way that we think about who we are as a nation. And I would say that no protest in the history of our country that has had a significant effect on the way we live and on the quality of life that we enjoy has been peaceful. Nothing mm. from the American Revolution, nothing from the Civil Rights Movement, right. not even from Black Lives Matter four years ago, which it's, it's hard to believe that we are four years out from the height of those protests and we still have not learned. So I'd first say check the language and then think about over-reliance on some of those official uh, sources. Mm -hmm. Press the police a little bit harder and stop running their press releases as news. Mm. Jeff, as you read the press and watch TV, which I know you do a, a great deal of, at least your favorite channels, how do you um, how do you frame the point we were just discussing about reliance on sources? Uh, I, I think that's critical. And um, Meredith wrote the textbook for what newsrooms ought to be able to do in in the brand new tool of Twitter, and especially in this case, Black Twitter. Uh, let's let's keep in mind here that. Uh, what's been going on in this country has been going on for a very long time. What's new is that people who were not represented in all senses of the word in mainstream mass newsrooms now have a place to have a voice. And that happens to be social media. And, and I think that that's uh, uh, critical. And, and it's through not only Black Lives Matter, but the thing that taught me more than anything was living while black. To see exactly what happened to... George Floyd, that in the mm. most innocent of activity of driving down or walking down a street or bird watching or going for lunch or going into your own home in Cambridge, Massachusetts, someone can call the police on you and the police can come and it can be a death sentence, right? So what are the voices we need to hear there? They're there. They're on Twitter. You can find them. You can no longer argue. I don't know anybody. It's hard to find. In the case of COVID, I created a COVID Twitter list um, in a weekend. It's now, I maintain it, it now has um, 600 epidemiologists, virologists, uh, uh, geneticists, and so on. Yet on television, I still see every morning, uh, Morning Joe has Dr. Dave on. Well, he's a spine surgeon talking about virology. We really need a better sense of, of getting new voices, especially in television. Mm -hmm. And now that we all have this setup, right? Now that you can reach almost anybody this way, there's no excuse for going to the same old voices over and over again. And are you accusing mainstream media of doing that in addition to the Morning Joe anecdote? Do you see a lot of that? Yeah, I do. And and mind you, there's a lot of, of sources I, I think highly of. I mean, I just watched the memorial service and Eddie Glau Jr. from Princeton. I, I want him on every time. So I'm not suggesting that there needs to be uh, a mass firing of people. I'm suggesting that there's an ability to add new voices that haven't been heard before. And generally, television always gets, the bookers always get, and reporters always get down to uh, the same people. We at, at the Newmark School have joined in the BBC 5050 project, which has been aimed at gender equality, but we are not going to consider that sufficient. And we need to try to, I think, get journalists taught in, in J school how to track their own sourcing. Meredith, are you seeing new faces in, in coverage these days? Uh, we're seeing some new faces. I think uh, a number of news consumers are actually going directly to Twitter because they realize that the faces um, and the voices that they want to hear from aren't necessarily in our legacy newsrooms in mainstream media newsrooms. They're the people who are out living in these communities and reporting on their everyday realities. And I would add um, a, a note of caution about that as well. Uh, Jeff did mention, you know, living while black and, and seeing the perspective of those stories. Uh, we have to remember with the slaying of Breonna Taylor, you know, there was no one there to capture that narrative, um, to stream it for us to see what black death looked like. And so we have to think about diversifying our sources, uh, bringing more voices in, and really journalism has to think about sharing power with citizens.
Hey, Meredith, can I ask you too, uh, since you're on that, um, the the video that we've seen again and again and again that becomes witnessing, but also then becomes a spectacle. Right. Um, what's your view on the policy that media ought to have in terms of showing us this harsh reality and not using it? You know, I don't have a solid uh, opinion on this just yet. Um, as a black woman, a former journalist, um, a woman who is married to a black man, has uh, a black brother and uh, soon a black nephew um, and currently a black niece already. Uh, I, I, I chafe at the need to see black death in order for people to understand what difficult conditions that black people, people of color, queer folks in this country are living under. I think it's something that needs to be taken into account by every news organization. And I think uh, should those organizations decide to use those images, they should provide their readers, their viewers, their consumers with advance warning that those images are coming. And in most cases, I think they are. And that is a obviously a very tricky balance because it's not like people like me and Jeff and maybe Alex who are watching a lot are the actual viewers. And there are people who will see that video for the first time at various points in time. It's, it's a tricky challenge for TV news producers, no doubt. I think we can agree. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about entrepreneurship a little bit. Both of you are really interested uh, in that subject. You know, here at the News Project, we believe in support news and information entrepreneurs. And Jeff, you run an entrepreneurial center. And I know, Meredith, you're passionate about uh, new initiatives. Are there emerging new sites um, at this point in time that are, are leading the way? And are there entrepreneurial opportunities to fill the many, many voids that exist out there, especially in communities where coverage of certainly urban politics and urban centers is diminished? Meredith? Oh, I definitely say that there are some folks who are doing really good work. Uh, Sarah Alvarez is one of the folks who comes to mind with Outlier Media. Sarah's experiment to get um, news to, to people in Detroit by texting them information and giving them exactly what they needed um, and tools to contact elected officials was revolutionary. Um, I'd also nod to the undefeated. Um, I know it's not the typical kind of startup that we think about, but the fact that Soria McDonald uh, was one of those folks who was able to be uh, awarded or at least recognized by the Pulitzer Center um, for her work, for her commentary, points to some of the great work that's being done out there. The Undefeated is one of my favorite sites, hands down, and her piece today about necks in American culture was just yes. so fascinating, yeah. Jeff, the nature of the current entrepreneurial opportunity? Um, I, I, I think that our media house was on fire and COVID threw gunpowder on it. We're going to see things burn down. We see uh, every newspaper chain in this country is controlled by hedge funds or by exhausted families. So I think mm. that where there is going to be opportunity is in new sprouts rising. And I believe that for some time, but it's hard. It's very hard. Uh, mm. We're starting a new uh, certificate program at uh, the uh, Newmark School or remade entrepreneurial journalism program for the independent resilient journalist, knowing that new media startups are very rarely going to get investment. Uh, I also just this afternoon was part of, was, was a witness to a, an event that our uh, Center for Community Media did with African-American media. And there are a lot of great new entrepreneurs there, but we need to figure out how to give them support, how to get them sufficient capital to start, how to get them training, uh, how to band together. Uh, I think that, that what's going to replace the old journalism we had is not some new overnight uh, messianic version of uh, journalism rescued. It's going to be a bunch of experiments that come from communities, especially that weren't part of the old media. Right. Meryl, while we're on this topic, um, obviously we work for a company that tries to support media entrepreneurs. Can you tell people a little bit more about TNP? Thanks, Alex. Uh, the, the News Project um, has built a platform that uh, we think is um, among the best in the world that is comprehensive and offers news entrepreneurs, existing news sites, small publications, the opportunity to have the best tools, capabilities, templates, everything you need. We think of it as news business in the box. And this, um, this platform is core to our business. We're um, in the process of adding sites to it whose work will live on that platform. 
We also offer a variety of consultative services. Alex, for instance, uh, helps people with audience growth um, and how to maximize both their work today and this new platform. So we are, we think, the most comprehensive solution around for small to medium-sized newsrooms, and we can help them, especially in these moments of stress, dealing deal with figuring out how to maximize their audience at a time when advertising really is uh, is literally at zero for some news organizations. And we can help them both with tools and our approaches. But thanks for that, Alex. Over to you. Thanks, Meryl. So Meredith and Jeff, I wanted to get back to some of the problems we've been pointing out here. And, and Meredith, there have been many, many compelling critiques of news orgs using passive and ambiguous language, things like protesters hit with rubber bullets as if those rubber bullets materialized out of nowhere and chose to hit the protesters on their own. Are there questions news orgs should always ask themselves when writing headlines or tweets, guidelines they should be using? Oh, absolutely. Um, if for nothing else, I think the resource to always consider is the question of power. And that mm -hmm. is one that is malleable and flexible enough for any newsroom, anyone doing any reporting um, at any scale. So who stands to benefit from the way this narrative is presented? Um, mm -hmm. Who is in power? Who is featured in this story. And then the question, of course, of who is missing from the story. Mm -hmm. uh, it's imperative that, especially in moments like these, news organizations remember to put these events in context. There's often a historical context that can tell a story of power, power relations, power dynamics, uh, that will help them reposition how they think about reporting on some of these stories. And of course, I just want to add here as a journalism teacher, you know, rule number one in news writing, use active voice. Uh, right. if, if nothing else, check that in the stories before they go out to press. Jeff, do you have anything on that? Thank you, Meredith. That was great. No, I think that was uh, an excellent lecture from Professor uh, Clark. <laughs> Um, Meryl? Je Je Jeff, uh, Meredith, I don't know how much attention you have the time or um, inclination to devote to right-wing media, but they're a loud voice on this story as well, with theories and coverage points around the role of Antifa and radical uh, groups. They largely uh, speak to um, groups they, they believe are on the radical left, what they describe as the radical left. There are many, many um, theories um, that float around about uh, that topic. How do you think about right-wing media, conservative media, as they're dealing with this moment? Jeff? Um, so I have had the courage to switch over occasionally to Fox News. And it's it a different be, narrative, isn't it, Jeff? Uh, it absolutely is. So, so while people are talking about demonstrations and injustice, they're over there blaming things on Antifa and uh, presenting that narrative. And I, I'm, I'm blunt about this. Um, uncharacteristically, I guess, that the single most um, vile uh, actor in American and English language democracy in the world today is Rupert Murdoch. And, and I think mm -hmm. that Fox News, on top of, of talk radio, but primarily Fox News, has done terrible damage to our democracy. And I don't know how it's going to be fixed. And in part, I, 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 my paradoxical view of this is I blame us in liberal media, too, because I don't think that, and I'm liberal and I'm media, but I don't think we admitted that going mm -hmm. back. And we ended up with a, a situation where we had an entirety of liberal media and one outlet for mm -hmm. what was then called conservative. And um, so I actually believe that the most important thing for us to do in entrepreneurial journalism is to get new communities who have not been served, which means people of color, LGBTQ, and so on. But I also believe that we need a competitor to Fox News. We need mm -hmm. to create some other structure that has some narrative. When I've talked to people uh, in the old right, the anti-Trump right about this, they just say we're too small. And that's that's a problem of our of our belief in mass media that something has to be huge. No, we need other perspectives to combat the bile that comes from Fox. Uh, Meredith, you have a point of view on what we're seeing from uh, so-called conservative media? I tell you honestly, because time is a non-renewable resource, I don't spend a lot of time mm -hmm. uh, watching, listening to, paying attention to conser conservative media. Um, I have my intake online, and what I see there uh, is troublesome if this form of media is supposed to be news, right? I decline to call Fox News. I think it's more entertainment. Um, and you can see that in the comparison of the way that they didn't 
cover protests initially and now how they are being covered uh, somewhat sporadically and with a very, very editorial message. Um, what I can say though is that what concerns me about the conservative media that circulates through social media in particular is this focus on America's divisions, uh, particularly along the lines of race, and the fact that that enables foreign bad faith actors, as we saw with the Internet Research Agency, um, to infiltrate our social discourse and to upset us to a point where people don't turn out to the polls, uh, where people turn out to rallies and marches that don't exist. And it's just unfortunate that we see so many of these outlets walking hand in hand with folks who are frankly the enemies of the United States. I just wanna um, quickly thank our pe everyone watching us. Uh, I just wanna reintroduce our guests for those who tuned in late. We're talking to Dr. Meredith Clark and Jeff Jarvis. Um, and uh, we are talking about uh, coverage of protests over the past 10 days since George Floyd's killing. Um, I, Meredith, we, we touched on this in the intro a little bit about some news orgs that have become part of the story in certain mm -hmm. ways. And one of them was Philadelphia Inquirer that uh, rightly earned outrage this week when it posted a headline that said buildings matter too, I believe it was. Yes. Um, so when, when a local paper does something like this, uh, and it's shown in the past day or two that it's not responsive to the pushback it's gotten, but if they were more responsive, what can, what can a news organization do to regain the trust of its readers uh, once it realizes what, how it's broken it? Well, from an old media theoretical perspective, uh, they would want to engage in image repair. And image repair stems from denying that anything was wrong to actually being mortified about what you did wrong, owning it and apologizing. But for the media environment that we have now that is very fractured, where people far outside of Philadelphia have seen and heard about this headline, um, I would encourage you know triage immediately, right? And it needs to start at home. So I assume knowing the editors at the Inquirer that they are talking to the journalists of color um, who were offended and allies, accomplices who were offended, they need to make amends to the local community. And they need to recognize that this isn't, you know, this was a one time thing as far as this one headline was concerned. But for readers, for audience members, and specifically for disenfranchised folks in that community, it is one in a series of slights that has right. come from the newspaper. And so if they want to improve community relations and their community standing, they're going to have to do the work of repair, actually getting into the community, listening and implementing uh, the suggestions that they get in order to repair community relations. It's a process, it's gonna be a long one. Alex, let me, let me if I will, yes, uh, yes, please. quibble with your question uh, in a quibble that I learned, because I too <laughs> used yes. the phrase, rebuild trust. And yeah. a colleague said, mm -hmm. Well, you presume there ever was trust in these communities. Oh, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. and, good and, point. I, and I think that's that's critical. I think the it, the Inquirer uh, was once a great paper, uh, but it defined great as pr impressing Pulitzer judges. It defined mm -hmm. uh, that as impressing fellow journalists. And how well did it serve the community? I don't think the communities in Philadelphia have felt listened to by the Inquirer, uh, perhaps ever. And, and so what do you do in that case? Right. I don't know that, that the Inquirer can do anything. I don't know whether how much do we give up on big old media and how much do we think it can be saved? Uh, I don't know. I honestly don't know the answer to that question. But I do think you need to do some radical new things. One project that I quite love is called Spaceship Media, which is based in California, which did a lot of projects with uh, advanced publications out of Alabama, where there are some innovators, which is dialogue-driven journalism, which is bringing together communities uh, and and helping them to have a, a productive, informed, and respectful conversation. Uh, hmm. That's the kind of, of, of structure that I think we need to rethink, that we're not just about telling stories and making narratives. You know, I, I face this with my, with my students too. What's the real job now? Is it to cover the marches or is it to cover that which led to them? Um, uh, and that's a, that's an excellent point, uh, Jeff. And, and thoughtful researchers like you and Meredith will no doubt study this moment going forward. But I'm under the general impression that the public is seeing pictures of um, buildings in flames and looters 
and drawing some equivalence between that and hundreds of thousands of people marching across the Brooklyn Bridge or marching through West Hollywood. Am I right or am I wrong? Meredith, I think it, it, it depends on which audience members you talk to and where they're getting their news and information from. But that context collapse is very easy and it is very easily aided by news media. Uh, we have these old norms that we have that say go out and cover the thing that is on fire, um, even though that there's a march of people going by at the same time that giving attention to those sorts of things, to property destruction uh, rather than people is frankly conflating for the audience that these two things are the same when they are not. Um, it is also allowing the audience to think that perhaps all of these people who are out participating in the marches and in the protests are doing the same things. And we have to remember that there are actually agents of chaos who have infiltrated these marches. We saw it some years ago in Dallas when someone took advantage of one of the marches to uh, assault, shoot, and kill several police officers. And we're seeing it now with the destruction of property. Jeff, your your take on, on my assumption that the public's a little confused about marching versus looting? Um, yes, but I think it's even more than that. Uh, you know, and, and Meryl, you and I are the ones here who are old enough to remember the 60s. And, and I, I feel Thank like you, I'm... Uh, I know you are. I I I, uh, I think I'll, I'm reliving them right now because because political strife, racial strife, uh, uh, violence, uh, demonstrations, and even a, even a rocket shot, uh, it's all kind of coming back at the same time. And and sadly, I don't think we've learned much of anything. Mm. You know, I, I was struck about two weeks ago before the murder of Mr. Floyd that Bishop William Barber had a letter to Congress. That I thought was was brilliant, and and it said, it basically said that we've devalued human life, mm -hmm. that we have not, we're not counting who's lost, and that mm -hmm. happens in the single life of George Floyd, but it happens in the hundred that more well more than hundred thousand lives lost to COVID. Mm -hmm. These are people who were we call essential, but we forced to go to work. Uh, because they can't afford not to, or because we need them to do the jobs that people like me don't have to do. Uh, and they don't have the health care, and they don't have the hospitals that are decent, and or they're old. And we've become, I fear, very much a society of disposed human life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and I think that media have not, they've tried. The New York Times, uh, when the New York Times screws up, it screws up. But when it does brilliantly, it does brilliantly. And it's COVID page one. With the the yeah. as we approached the hundred thousand names was brilliant as a way to humanize the loss and remind us of the loss, but I think media have not done a good job of that. And and this is twenty four hour news as well. It's us looking at the the best video of the moment, not at the meaning. We're uh, we're entering the last block of the program, the last uh, a couple of segments, and just want to remind viewers: let us know where you're watching from. Let us know what's on your mind. Let us know if you have. Uh, questions for our guests. We'd love to have them and love to have you or engage. arguments or, or criticisms or, or debates. Yes. And if New York Times, if you want to defend yourself uh, here for the little <laughs> jabs you're getting, yes, just there want. Join, they're join having in. their own issues today. Yes, they so. they're, 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 they'll be watching us uh, uh, on tape later today. Yeah. Uh, Alex? So, uh, you know, a question is we've talked a lot about legacy media, but, uh, you know, social media has played a huge role in this um, and a question for both of you about this. It, it, it's been a tool for organizing and spreading information, but we've also seen social media weaponized for disinformation campaigns. Um, and, and what do you think Twitter and Facebook, what do you think their responsibility is here to be you stopping things like harassment and, and disinformation and, and the kind of collapse of truth? Or do you think that they are just a platform and, and shouldn't be taking anything down or, or taking any of those actions? Meredith, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey both would love to consider themselves as anything other than publishers. But the fact of the matter is there are millions of people around the world publishing on their platforms every day, the platforms that they made possible. I think this is a time for those platforms to start thinking about the social media that they, or excuse me, the social responsibility that they have mm -hmm. uh, in the same way that we had a commission that thought about the social responsibility of the press, not quite as well upheld as we would like, 
Um, but it's time for them to think about what their values are, who they're going to be accountable to, and how they're going to be consistent with them. And we saw Twitter taking one step forward um, with putting some warning labels and qualifiers on uh, Donald Trump's tweets. But Mark Zuckerberg saying that Facebook doesn't want to be the arbiter of truth when, in fact, in a number of countries, it is. When Facebook is the internet right. in different countries, we have seen that it is the arbiter of truth. People have paid for that with their lives. It's time for them to think about being responsible citizens. Mm. Jeff, Jeff? I, 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 we know you have points of view on this topic. Uh, yes, I do. Um, and first, in full disclosure, I helped raise money for the school from Facebook for projects about disinformation, primarily outside of the school, but I received nothing from any of the platforms personally. And in, indeed, I've been critical, uh, especially this week, of Facebook uh, in Mark Zuckerberg's effort to kind of run away from this decision. I think Jack Dorsey did finally the right thing in saying, yes, the public should see what Trump says, as vile as it is, but that fa that Twitter should not promote it. Twitter should add context to it, and Twitter should label it for what it is, and Twitter should thus stand apart. Zuckerberg hasn't done that, and he's hiding behind two ideas. One is that he's not the grand fact checker. Well, we don't need him to fact check Donald Trump. We know he lies. And the other one he stands behind is freedom of expression. Well, Donald Trump has plenty of freedom of expression, and, and the issue is not whether Donald Trump can speak or should speak or should even speak on Facebook, though it is their choice to have him or not. The issue is what does Facebook stand for and what does Mark Zuckerberg stand for? And do they stand apart from this and say, no, we don't, it may be here, but we don't approve of this. This is vile. So I went recently and I looked at two historical documents. One was Benjamin Franklin's apology for printers, which was none, nothing of the sort. Yeah. Um, and I took, it was, it, he got, he got upset with people who were getting mad with him for what he printed off his press, not just his newspaper, but advertisements. And he wrote a screed about this and I took it uh, rather idiotically and replaced printer and printing with social media and platform and serve and post. And what you see is Franklin says, there are things that I won't print, but if you find that you end up only with that, which I believe Franklin does, you're gonna have something very boring or only that which you, the reader wants, is very boring. And he saw himself as a platform. He saw the press as a platform more than as a, um, a, a factory. And I also reread John Milton's Areopagitica, which was a, a grand defense of freedom of expression uh, against licensing of books in England. And I, I think we have to get to a point where we do trust the public. Right now, we see a lot of moral panic. We see a lot of third person effect, which is saying that everybody else is an idiot and affected by this, but I'm, I'm immune, I'm okay. Um, and a lot of paternalism here. Hmm. We need to have freedom of expression. We need to have discussion, but we don't need the New York Times inviting Tom Cotton to write fascism. We don't need uh, uh, Facebook to stand back and act as if it has no role in deciding what its platform stands for. Uh, as Meredith says, the time has come for them to take a stand here as uncomfortable as that is for them. Alex? So, yes, thank you. I just wanted to say hi to our social followers here, to uh, Paula, Jax, Rose, Bill, Peter. Um, thank you so much for watching and tuning in. Um, and I wanted to get back to that New York Times uh, post that you mentioned, Jeff. Um, so uh, for context for our readers, uh, the New York Times op-ed section published a piece by Tom Cotton called Send in the Troops, uh, calling for military uh, to go into states uh, using the Insurrection Act uh, and say, and, and, and quell violence by whatever means. And he used a lot of shaky arguments. He misquoted the constitution, invoked Antifa, which the FBI found was not part of these, pro is not a big part of the uh, the protests, et cetera. Um, and, and so the question then became, why did the New York Times give them, give him this publish, give him this platform and what is their responsibility on this level? And we heard from their um, staff as a result. Uh, and, and Meredith, can you give us your thoughts about this? Um, yeah, I, I think of it in terms of the symptoms of several different problems um, all coming to a head at once, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have the issue, of course, of economics at, at papers like the New York Times, where you have fewer copy editors, you have fewer people who 
um, are able to take a look at the copy before it goes out. You have less deliberation and time. Um, I would like to think that the Times did not allow Tom Cotton to write his own headline. And thus there is someone inside that organization who also plays a role in uh, this column being framed the way that it was aside from its content altogether. Um, but you're also seeing this issue of people from different places not having their voices heard. The Times would create this false equivalency saying that there are views that we need to hear uh, that are equally important. And there are those views, they exist, but they are also factually accurate. They are grounded in reason and they uphold mm -hmm. respect for human dignity. And this column did none of those things. Yeah, and I, I want to also quote uh, Meredith's uh, colleague, Siva Varianathan, uh, who points out that the, that the Times didn't just uh, create a space for it. They helped polish it. They added a headline mm. to it. They, they promoted it. And, and think of it this way. Um, it's as if you imagine that the New York Times ran Facebook. All Facebook does, in some small defense, is say, here's a spot anybody can use it, including Donald Trump. The New York Times invites Tom Cotton to come in, polishes the piece, uh, amplifies the piece, mm -hmm. distributes the piece. That's worse. And mind you, I'm, I'm firmly of the belief that the platforms are not media, that instead, mm -hmm. um, uh, and the internet is not a medium. Uh, media is a subset of the internet. And, and so we need new rules and new ways to look at this. But if we insist upon looking at it with analogs, then the New York Times with Tom Cotton is worse than... Mm -hmm. Facebook with Trump. I want to know. So Jeff, uh, can I just follow up on that really quickly, Jeff, in terms of uh, the digital things? So in an old newspaper setting, this would have appeared in the paper holistically and might have been buttressed by articles that contradict these facts. This is a standalone piece of content, right? So there's a lot of context missing. Is that part of the problem? That's part of the problem, and and there's a, there's a we're in an age of abundance, but but print is still scarce, and the Times chose to use its scarce resource to do this. I'll go back mm. to COVID and the Times, right? They brought on a um, an armchair epidemiologist, uh, not a top expert, to talk about well the the a line that Trump soon used, uh, the disease may be less bad than the cure, mm. and. Uh, epidemiologists in my Twitter list, bitly.com slash COVID Twitter list, um, had a fit because the New York Times gave space to someone who was inexpert to have an opinion that had no context and didn't give that space to credentialed expert epidemiologists. And so there was just simply terrible news judgment there. I want to raise a question and also acknowledge some people who are watching and have said hello, Bill Seamring. The uh, founder of National Public Radio has joined us today. Uh, media consultant Peter Kreisky, uh, writing us from Newburyport, um, joins us today. Bill Boggs, legendary talk show host, joins us today, uh, probably from New York. I'm not sure. Uh, Peter Krasilovsky joins us from Oregon. And Jax Fellows asks a very good question, which is, which is uh, one that segues into a question we, we wanted to put on the table today with you folks. And that is, how do you get structural change in newsrooms? And Meredith, um, Jeff, if somebody handed you a newsroom, you came in as consultant or editor in chief, Meredith, let's start with you. What steps would you take to get the newsroom responsive to the kind of concerns we're talking about today? I'm marching everyone back to the classroom. We are going to have to come <laughs> up with new curriculum. Uh, mm -hmm. We are going to have to, the, the model that we have for journalism today was developed, structured and refined in a time where women by and large were not part of news organizations, where people of color were locked out of those organizations, where anyone essentially who was not a straight white man was not at the decision-making table. You cannot take an imperfect foundation, put a house on it and expect for that house to stand. So I say we have to start all over again uh, we'd go back to school. We'd start thinking about critical perspectives and putting community at the center of our reporting and work from there. Jeff? I, uh, I love that. Um, yeah. I, I have to say in full disclosure that I also think that, I'll speak only for my school, we also have work to do inside the school. Absolutely. So we become better at this and, and, and I constantly have things to learn here. I've tried to go into newsrooms with what I think is um, 
a path. Uh, and it comes out of the thinking behind the social journalism degree that we have at Newmark with my brilliant colleague, Carrie Brown, uh, where we start with the community, not with content. We start with the conversation, not with content. The students, and I see Joe Amditas, uh, one of the graduates is in, is in the chat. Um, uh, and, and, we, and we tell them to go find a self-defined community, not a, an externally mm. defined community, not bullshit like millennials. And to observe and listen to and empathize with and respect and reflect that community before deciding what journalism that community might need and how to bring it. And, and so that's what I've tried to convince news organizations to do as also a business move that they move away from mass media and what the internet really killed is the idea of the mass to understanding how to serve communities, but they just aren't capable of it because they can only think in scale and only think in, in terms of one product to serve all. And that's the greatest lesson we have from the net is that doesn't work anymore. Um, I want to get to a couple more questions from yeah. the audience, um, Alex, if that's okay. One, yeah. one is from Peter Kreisky, the aforementioned Peter Kreisky, who asks, is it possible that the times we're in will create an alignment of brand new voices? And he cites in that regard, the, uh, the Bulwark, a um, uh, anti-Trump Republican-based um, uh, talk site, and then, um, and then the Lincoln Project, new voices that are surely having audience uh, growth as a result of the moment. Meredith, Jeff? Jeff? Um, I'm not sure, but I think I see in, in, the, in the Center for, I'm plugging my school a lot today. Um, <laughs> Meredith's being much more dignified than I am. Um, at the Center for Community Media event today, what we saw was African-American media talking about working together. Mm. Um, and I think we see uh, efforts to realize that we're no longer uh, lone uh, foxes out there hunting in the woods, that we've got to work together and collaborate more and find more efficiency together. So I hope so, but it's not our reflex to work together. Yeah. Alex? I am. Um... Well, I was, oh, sorry, Meredith, go ahead. I was, I was just gonna quickly follow up on that um, and refer back to something that Jeff mentioned earlier, that we might have this explosion of new sprouts. I love the way that he put mm -hmm. that. But the only way that they are going to work is by breaking with our traditions of the past. You know, the folks who are able to create right now are people who have access to time as a resource, capital, labor, and the connections to make these things go. Uh, historically, there are communities that do not have access to those same resources. So if we're kind of relying on things to happen magically, all we're going to see is a number of smaller organizations that replicate the same power structures that we have now, that are failing communities that don't have the same pockets and the same connections. So this is exactly, thank you, Meredith. This is what I was going to bring up in response to Peter's question is the Lincoln Project, while new, is made up of four of the most powerful men in right on the right. You know, it's, these are not new voices. It might be a new project they've put together, right? So the challenge seems more about how do we get people who are not in this space into this space? Is that correct, Jeff and Mary? I would say so, absolutely. Um, in the conversation about all of the protests right now, one of the questions that's being asked is, how can I help? How can I be an ally? And I think, mm -hmm. again, Jeff pointed this out, and he even did it with uh, my appearance here today. You make space for right. people, you bring them along, you sponsor them. Frankly, you turn over resources to them. That's one of the core mm -hmm. definitions of allyship, that you're willing to cede power uh, to the formerly uh, disempowered and to give them space to lead. Um, but, but, thank you for that credit. It was not deserved. Uh, but I, I, I agree. And I think it's the lesson that I've had to learn most is sharing power means giving up power and mm. doing that within an organization, within a school, within Twitter, uh, anywhere. Uh, I, I wrote a piece for an Irish publication that isn't up yet, but I, they said, Ireland wants to know what's going on. And I said, what you're seeing here is the last stand of the old white man. And I say that as an old white man. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's angry and often uneducated and racist and fascist, and we can add a lot of adjectives to it. But we have people who were in power who were losing that and who were frightened of that. So those of us who have had it have to find ways to give it up. And I have not done a good job of that. I have not figured out how to do that yet. I need to learn how to do that better. But that is the key lesson. We're not going to change this world until we hand over power to better people. Before, uh, before we move to closing thoughts from our guests, I do want to um, highlight next week's program. At this uh, same time, 6 p.m. Eastern next Thursday, we are going to have a single guest, an extraordinary guest, a really important 
person in the world of public television. He's Neil Shapiro, who's the president and CEO of uh, Channel 13, WNET in New York. And as such, he runs one of the most important public media, if not the most important public media outlet in the country. And he obviously, like anyone running an organization like that, has his challenges between the virus and an, whole, an entire company working at home, covering the protest and financing a public TV station right now. I expect to have a really insightful and informative conversation with Neil uh, next Thursday. Again, that's next Thursday, right here, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Um, Meredith, a, a final thought on the challenge at hand? I think the challenge at hand is that there are actually two pandemics, one which is chronic, and that is the issue of structural inequality and structural racism in this country, um, and how the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is exacerbated by that. And what we are seeing are the symptoms and outcomes of allowing the problem of structural racism and inequality uh, to go unchecked for too long. I believe that this is a moment of reflection and great change if we are brave enough to make it. Jeff? Uh, well, first I want to say thank you for having me, but I also want to say thank you for putting in the, me on the same screen with Meredith. I'm, I'm honored because mm -hmm. I've learned so much from her. And that's, I guess, my final thought is that I learned a great deal about what we called Black Twitter um, and what she studied to find how there are new voices there, not, 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 not new voices, how there are voices there that we were not hearing. And, and, and that is the challenge now. Whom do we amplify? Right. Is it Tom Cotton or is it someone in the community who's affected by this? And, and it's no longer hard to find these voices we've been ignoring. They're there. We can listen to them. And the key skill I have learned how to teach in teaching entrepreneurial journalism and social journalism is listening. And as trite as that may sound, we're not very good at listening in journalism. And now is the time to learn how. Jeff, thank you very much. And to, um, and to both Meredith and Jeff, Jeff thank you for joining us. Um, just a, a quick closing thought. This is an important topic. I hope it helps the people who um, participated in, in our program tonight frame uh, the, their viewing and their reading habits because there's a lot to digest and assess in the media we're consuming right now around the protests. We'll come back to this subject again. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate your participation. And please write us. You can write Alex at alex at thenewsproject.net. And you can write me, Meryl, Meryl at thenewsproject.net as well. Jeff, Meredith, again, thank you. And thank you all for watching. Thank you. Thank you. And Meredith, I hope you come back and tell us about your book when it comes out. I certainly will. Thank what you is so that, much. Meredith? What is that? Yes. Uh, the book is on Black Twitter. It's being submitted to the publisher in August. So maybe 2021, <laughs> early 2022. Uh, whenever, I'll be there. Excellent. Look forward to it. Thanks, Meredith. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.